So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the six things that helps uh, product succeed. And then if I have a little time, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of product management. I've been doing product management for about half the time that product management has been around. And then I'll talk about the importance of having values and a vision. Values for your company that the product maps into and a vision for your company and for your product. And then I'll offer you a challenge at the end. So that's my email address and connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you connect with me on LinkedIn and you want a PDF copy of my book, I'll be happy to send it to you. That's what it looks like. And um, if you are on Kindle and you have Amazon Prime, it's under the unlimited reading program, so it's free. Uh, but please go in there and leaf through all the pages because uh, they put together a pool of about $20 million. And the more pages that are read per book, that's what's given out that month. So if you could do that for me on a monthly basis, that would be appreciated. <laughs> A little of my background, I was classically trained as a product manager at Ground Zero for product management uh, at Hewlett Packard. Uh, I then was recruited by Apple uh, to take the first hard disk drive to market. Nobody could understand why they would have to spend $3,500 for five megabytes of storage. And they never thought they would need that much space. So I have all the arrows in my back trying to sell hard disk drives. They noticed I knew how to manage, <clears throat> so they asked me to take over is the group product manager for the Apple III, which had already been screwed up by Steve Jobs and two previous product managers. The first patent that Steve had was on the Apple III, uh, but they didn't pick the right market. Uh, they didn't put in the right features in order to be successful and so forth. Uh, so it was my job to unscrew that thing up. Uh, the popular uh, vanity about the Apple III is that it was a failure. It was not. At its time, it was the third largest uh, 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 sales of computers after the Apple II and the PDP-11. 75,000 uh, Apple III's were sold. We made enough profit, and this was before the Boston Computer Group talked about the cash cow. Apple did not realize that the Apple III was a cash cow, and it produced all the profits necessary for the development of the Macintosh and the Lisa. Mac would not be here today if it wasn't for the profits that my group, my division, uh, developed. And after I shut down the product line because we couldn't get any more support throughout the company, part of the reason for that is the company thought with all these MBAs running around uh, that there was the enterprise market, the home market, and the education market. The concept of the small and medium business market did not exist. So therefore, a business computer, there's no market for it. And so they poo-pooed the product line. And as a result of that, about 1,000 to 1,500 people at Apple were laid off in uh, early uh, 1985, including Steve Jobs. He was asked to leave because the Mac sales uh, dropped to four units in January of 1985. So if you want to talk about product failures, let's talk about the first Macintosh. The Mac didn't really take off until Jean-Louis Gasset took over as the VP of product management. Jean-Louis was my uh, general manager for the Apple III product line in France, along with the Apple II product line. Um, a couple years ago, I got appointed a distinguished professor at Manny Pal University, uh, and uh, they are putting together a whole product management curriculum for uh, uh, their global educational thing. And I called up my daughter and I said, now that I'm a distinguished professor, can you at least show me some respect? And she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my uh, book that I just uh, showed you. And then Wiley tells me that they are finally going to print this seven part series or seven part book called Foundations in the Successful Management of Products. And it's uh, seven books in there. I wrote the thing, finished it about two and a half years ago. It was about a thousand pages. They said that's not one book, so they turned it into seven books. And they're going to be offering up a university level curriculum which includes videos in the introduction to all of the topics in here. And uh, along with the book, exercises. This teaches you. Uh, what to do and how to do it, while this book talks about what needs to be done. The reason that I'm here and I'm motivated doing this is according to McKenzie, about $1.6 trillion was spent in 2014 for new product development. 
And according to a couple of professors at University of North Carolina, they found that the average rate of product failure is about 40%. So the world waste somewhere is between 35 to 95%, or somewhere between 0.5 and $1 trillion every year. And if we could just become more successful with the investments that we're doing now, then the world would be a better place. So these are the six key, uh, key uh, keys to product success, and it follows a mnemonic called SPICES, hence the name of my company, Spice Catalyst. First one is strategy, second one is process, third one is information, fourth one is customers, fifth one is employees, and the last one is systems. As far as strategy, these are the key components of the product strategy, the market strategy which uh, Michael talked about this morning, and I agree with him on a lot of things. Um, and I go to, down to a more basic level as opposed to Tony Ulrich's jobs that must be done or outcome-based uh, uh, innovation. I go down to the level of do, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, process is, you have to have a process that's repeatable. And what you see up there on the lower left-hand side is the product management framework that I developed after looking at everybody else's product management framework, and a lot of them will just get you into trouble, like the 280 <laughs> groups uh, framework. If you look at that, you won't even see the word agile on there any place. And there's eight reasons why the eight other uh, product management frameworks will cause you to have product failure, and I have that in a blog on my website. <laughs> Second thing you need to have is the information to get the job done at the right time. Uh, I was consulting with Cisco uh, a few years ago in their services department, uh, and I went to their market research department, and I looked at all 84 market research services that they subscribed to. Not one of them covered the services business, and at that time, it was a $4 billion a year business. Today, probably because they didn't follow my advice, they're up to about $12 billion. Uh, and uh, I asked them if they could buy these four services so I had real data on a problem that I was working for them, with them on, and that was how they're gonna compete with Huawei. And Huawei, of course, is the Chinese company that is uh, alleged to have put chips that report home uh, in all of their networking products. And they said, well, and this is like in February, they said, well, after our budget is approved in, uh, in July, uh, which will probably be about October, maybe next October, or next January, about nine months later, they could buy the reports. And how many people have had the same problem? You just can't get the information that you need in order to get your job done. So you're flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, one of the beauties of analytics and big data now is all that data is available. In fact, uh, one of the books I recommend you read is What Would Google Do? It's all about the data. Uh, so if your company has data, think about productizing it or selling it as a service. So uh, one of my students at India uh, put together a uh, Jira plugin which is that dashboard that you can see there where you can see the status of your product uh, market strategy, your marketing plan, your product development, all in one place. It's a free download right now, we're in beta, uh, from the uh, Atlassian uh, uh, marketplace. <coughs> so in terms of customers, knowing what to help you succeed, uh, you start out with what you see on the left there in terms of what the customer does. So for example, if I want to go from here to downtown San Jose tomorrow and have lunch, that's the job. But the things I need to do is I need to figure out, am I gonna take the light rail, or am I gonna drive, or I'm gonna hitchhike, or am I gonna use Waze carpool? When I get there, where am I gonna park? Uh, once I park, what restaurant am I gonna go eat at? How am I gonna get a reservation? All these little things are what you have to do. And then you need to have a customer structure and I advocate that you should have a vice president of product success, which you might call it at Facebook or at Apple, the vice president of product management. And I'll talk more about why I suggest the term product success a little bit later. And that they report directly up to the CEO at the same level as sales and finance and support and engineering. You should have that vertical of product. And if you look at companies such as Tesla, Amazon, uh, I suspect Starbucks, um, uh, Apple, obviously, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, VP of Product Management at Facebook, I understand, sits at the same table as uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg. The E stands for employees, and the employees need to have common core competencies, which you see listed there. But in the area of product management, you need to have all of these.
So the product manager does the things that you see there. You understand the framework, knowing what your customers do. Uh, they put together the clear value propositions, all the things that uh, Dan also talked about this, uh, earlier today. Pricing strategy, uh, distribution planning, and so forth. And then the product marketing manager are all of these things down here. And this is a great deal of confusion. Product managers are sometimes called product marketing managers when they're really product managers. People that are responsible for taking the product to market, that's the product marketing manager, gets all confused. And then we're all being drawn into UX design, so our design engineer, a product architect, a project manager. Uh, so I have a blog on my website about, uh, it has the first product manager and he's being uh, uh, dragged and quartered by horses in six different directions. And as a result of that, you never have time to do the things in the middle. And those are one of the keys to product success. And lastly, systems and tools. This is my uh, product management framework where you start out up here with the product management areas, then that you hand off to development, and then down here is launching the product and the ongoing sustaining marketing of the product. And there it is a little bit bigger. And you can download that PDF uh, from my website. So these are all the things that go into a product market strategy. A, product, a plan and a strategy are the same thing. The words are interchangeable. <coughs> Most people don't know that. And then you need to have these kinds of organizational and individual competencies. And I've just started the development of a product manager competency test, which I'll make available to anyone for free. And you can go in there and answer some questions and figure out where you are in terms of levels of competencies in all of these areas. Uh, that, and there's about 130 competencies that a product manager and product marketing manager need to have to be successful. And they're all outlined in detail in the, the foundations book. And um, with that, you could then get some idea of where you need to improve your skills. And then you can also show the report from that to a potential hiring manager. Um, also, um, once I have a large enough database of uh, individual competencies, and if you opt in, I'll make those databases available to hiring managers and recruiters and headhunters. So they can go in and say, okay, I need an expert in positioning that happens to live in Mountain View or something like that, and then can help find you. Because one of the biggest problems that product management has is finding people that know how to do the job uh, and have less time to train them on the job. And these are the things that you do for the marketing and the launch. And these are the things to do for operations. And then, of course, there's the end of life. Uh, that's what was my responsibility. And I ended the life the Apple III. Uh, and only one, one other product in the Valley had been ended of life at that time, the HP 300. So I hired Dave Crockett from HP, who had done that, and asked him what's the most important thing that I have to take into account when you end a life of product and that is maintaining your customer loyalty. So if you just drop the product uh, and the customer gets mad at you as a result of that, then they go away. And I was able to safely transition all the Apple III developers and customers over to the Macintosh without affecting the stock price at all. So then I talked about that Jira plugin. So the five keys, or six keys, are strategy, process, information, customers, employees, and systems. And this is something that I developed building on what Tony Ulrich uh, uh, talks about in outcome-based innovation. Go out and find out what does your customer do, how do they do it, when do they do it, why do they do it, where do they do it, who do they do it with, what's standing in their way, how important it is, and most important, how satisfied are they with the current solution. Some of the same things that Michael talked about this morning. Uh, I heard uh, Jeffrey Moore speak in 1982 at Apple University. Uh, on crossing the chasm, so it's kind of baked into my DNA. And the way you do that is you go out and observe, like a social anthropologist. The example of uh, Henry Ford asked people if they wanted a car, and people said, no, I want a faster horse. HP asked, do you want a color ink jet printer? said, no, I don't, want, uh, I don't want to pay extra for color. So they said, how about if you have a black and white printer, and we add in color at no cost, then people said yes. So the questions that you ask to find out what people want are very critical to understanding what kind of product you should be developing for. <coughs> the, 
question Henry Ford should have asked is, would you like to get from point A to point B faster? So think about the questions that you're asking. So here's a brief history of uh, product management. Uh, as Sir Winston Churchill famously said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And a lot of you guys are repeating your history because product management up until now has been pretty much handed down from one company to the next. One of my fellow product managers at HP went to Symantec, VP of product management. They had nothing, so he brought everything over from HP. Whether it worked or didn't work, it didn't matter. They just brought those processes over. So it started at PG&E from a guy by the name of Neil McElroy in 1931. He later went on to be president of Procter & Gamble, and every president of Procter & Gamble since was a brand manager before that. They're a mini general manager. And then I found a lot of evidence in the, my research uh, that Neil was very influential to Harvard and also an advisor to Stanford. And HP is where Stanford start, uh, uh, HP started at Stanford with six founders, not just Bill and Dave. And they were all part of uh, Fred Tierman's electronics class. And they were heavily influenced by this concept of product management. They call it product management instead of brand management. Some companies call them business analysts. Are there any business analysts here? Yeah. yeah. Some companies call them product designers. And this is uh, McElroy's memo. They name the product, they distinguish and position the product, they focus on the product versus a business function like finance. Uh, it's a multi-divisional structure with decision, centralized decision making, not driven by Salesforce requests. <laughs> And if you go out and observe, and then you uh, interview, survey, and use big data to identify what your customer wants to do, if someone comes to you with a Salesforce request saying our largest customer has to have this particular feature, you look at your do list and say, I'm sorry, I don't even see it on there. And you can save probably your job and maybe the company. And they have full responsibility for everything. They coordinate with sales for the execution. They analyze sales, that's your analytics kind of stuff. They're focused on fast moving goods uh, and they have to be tactical and reactive. He wrote this in 1931. So you see embodied in there the job description for the product manager and the product marketing manager. <coughs> Unfortunately, the field of product management has not become as well known or as accredited as project management has, which started in 1948 or almost uh, 20 years later. Hopefully that will start changing, and it has. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, I think there was one or two books out on product management. Now there's at least a half, a, at least a dozen. And then one of the things you can look at is uh, the uh, way management was back in the 1930s and 40s, and continuing today. How many people say on the balance sheet, uh, uh, where you have your assets and your liabilities, how many people say that um, uh, human resources is an asset? on the balance sheet. Wrong, you are a liability. That's why when uh, there's a downturn, a lot of you get laid off. <laughs> HP never did that. They all agreed to say, okay, we'll work nine days out of every uh, 10 over two weeks so everyone could stay employed. And when HP was doing that, they would explode out of a recession uh, and pass everybody else up. Uh, and uh, they stopped doing that after Carly Farina became president, and, and she also destroyed the HP values. Uh, and uh, the company's been spiraling in ever since. Steve Jobs knew about this because I found some indications that Dave Packard uh, tutored and mentored Steve in the late 80s after he had uh, the failure of Next, which I call Last, and, uh, and then was struggling with uh, Pixar at that time. And this is long before he came back to Apple in 98. Uh, and he t said, do that. So when, in, in 2007, during the Great Recession, <coughs> Steve was quoted as doubling down on product research and development so that they could explode out of that recession and look what happened. Now they're the most valuable company in the world. So how many people say that uh, inventory on a uh, balance sheet is an asset? No, it's a liability. It is an asset. But... Uh, what kind of an asset is it if you're General Motors during the Great Recession and you had 19 million cars you couldn't get rid of? The problem with this is this management structure and accounting basis that the finance people learn at schools like here 
goes back to the Industrial Revolution, going from agriculture to the industrial. We are now in a digital information revolution, and the accounting systems, the CPAs, and the accounting boards have yet to update their financial uh, tools in order to measure company success. And then, of course, we had the advent of um, uh, Wall Street in 1980 when I was at HP. Uh, they stopped looking at annual results and started looking at quarterly results. So now, that's, that's why you see these wide fluctuations in the stock prices. It's because everything's focused on the short term and not on the long term. And I also did an analysis of um, companies that were on the Fortune 500 list in 1965 and found that over 300 of them have gone out of business, primarily because of the focus on the short term versus the long term. Look at Eastman Kodak, for example. They invented photography. They killed their own digital uh, camera, which was invented at uh, Kodak, Kodak in 1973. And they never made it. And now it's worth less than a billion dollars. One of the key things is, um, and HP struggled with, was that they were late to systems. They couldn't put together the terminals and the computers and the printers from the different divisions. That's when Steve came up with the idea of one profit center, the entire company. And the product at Apple is the whole product. It's the Apple Care, the customer service. You walk into the dealership, it's, everything is a consistent experience. You take it home, open the box up, your out-of-box experience, and so forth. Also, management back in those days had the matrix management like you see at uh, uh, General Electric, which HP adopted, or you had a military type of management with the command and control from the top down. And the reason being is, in those days, the largest organization, other than the military, was the railroads. And all the companies were struggling how to do that. HP came up with the idea of having decentralized individual divisions, never more than 500 people in any division. That way, the decision making can be pushed down to be as close to the customer as possible. And. Apple and HP said they must maintain a balance between short-term profits and investment for future strength and growth. Uh, H, uh, Apple doesn't really care about the profits. They focus on the customer experience, and they know the profits will follow. When I was hired into uh, HP product management, I uh, was given one product, which was at this stage, and that was product management, and another product about to be introduced which is product marketing. So I got trained in both of those areas. And then this indicates some of the key responsibilities of product management and product marketing. The importance of vision and values is at HP and at Apple, when I went into a meeting on a product, everyone was coming from it or towards that issue or those solutions or the problems with the same set of values. And we measured things against those same set of values. And one of the things that happened uh, when I was presenting a business plan to take the Apple III off as an independent business unit, uh, we put together the options of what to do with the product line in terms of the company's values. And then Mar uh, Steve uh, uh, Kwame, uh, who was the vice president, senior vice president of Apple at the time, Floyd asked me if we make the decision to kill the product line right now, or if we make the decision to let the product line continue as long as the market continues to buy it, and a dealer called you, what would you say? I said, well, if it's the latter, I say, so long as the market wants it, we'll keep the product and everything will be happy. But if the decision is to kill the product line right now, I'll give the, customer, the dealer your phone number. And the executive committee laughed at that, and the following week they asked me to take over as the business unit manager, or bum, uh, for the Apple III. And it's because they knew that one of the values of Apple was empathy for the customers. Another value was good management. And by killing the product line arbitrarily like that would violate those two values. And one of the things that uh, Dave Packer put together, and you can Google this, is the 10 things that helps you get along with other people. This is something you should internalize as a product manager. And uh, Peter Burles says the idea of an 
of a, this kind of a decentralized system. The essence of an idea of radical time was the employee's brain power was the company's most important resource. That's true at uh, HP, that's true at Apple, that's true at Amazon. And this is the essence of the HP way. Trust and respect for individuals, focus, high level of achievement, uncompromising integrity, teamwork, flexibility, and innovation. How many people have similar values to this at your companies? My father worked at HP for 37 years. <laughs> and it's probably internalized. Yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yep. Um, and that has spread to many other companies around the world. Yeah. Get as close to the customer as possible, even the salesperson taking the side of the customer. I did that once and got fired, so <laughs> it's a little scary thing to do. It's the way things done. Now, if I told you the vision of the company is to make a technical contribution and uh, I will defer what the product is going to be until a later time, how many people would rate that on a scale of 1 to 10? Show of hands of 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, don't care. Usually when I ask that question, it averages at about three. That was the vision of HP. Now this is a company that followed that vision and its values, and it grew 20% a year every year for 50 years. Can you name another company that's ever had that level of success? And if you don't have values, Uber, Volkswagen, Facebook, you begin to have problems. And those are the Apple values, very similar to HP's. Turns out that uh, our VP of HR was also, Ann Bowers was also VP of HR at Intel. And she brought the concept of having Apple values over to the company when it first got started. So the key to the successful product is the outcome, targeting the do's, and then down that stack there. And this is very similar to what uh, uh, Dan Olson talks about, very similar to what Michael talked about. So I've got a question for you. What's the best thing about your company, your individual company? Can I have better experience. Pardon? Can I have better experience. Experience? What else? Anybody? Integrity. Pardon? Integrity. Integrity, okay. Mission. 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 Okay. People. People? You're all wrong. <laughs> you are. You're the best thing about your company. What's the worst thing about your company? <laughs> Same answer, you are. If you don't take the bull by the horns like I did with the Apple III, because they had went off, went off and they canceled the product line without talking to me, and I got called into the president's office and he says to me, hey Dave, we've got $20 million worth of piece parts, what should we do about it? I said, what do you mean we, pale face? And uh, he hadn't heard the joke. Most people haven't now either. Back in the 50s, we had the Lone Ranger and Tonto and they were galloping through the um, desert, and they get surrounded by 10,000 yelling, screaming Indians. When I tell this story in India, I have to say American Indians. <laughs> and um, uh, Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, we're surrounded by 10,000 yelling, screaming Indians, and all they want to do is scalp us. What should we do, Tonto? And Tonto says, what do you mean, we, pale face? <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, we need a small autonomous unit. I told him about the soul of the new machine, I told him about uh, uh, Kelly Johnson, the Lockheed Skunk Works, who I knew in my previous uh, career, uh, and how you get small teams. At the Skunk Works, Kelly could get a brand new airplane done in 18 months. The rest of Lockheed would take seven years. And uh, when I was with the previous consulting group, all I hear was product managers whining about the fact that they don't have any authority. So I put together a generic presentation that you could download from my website just change it for your presentation to your manager to ask for the budgetary authority for your product, including the marketing money, uh, the sales training money, the um, market research money. Then you're the general manager of the product and you're no longer the product janitor. So quick whining and ask for the authority. After all, it'll work for me, it'll work for anybody. And then I suggest mm -hmm. that you ask for a change in your title. Mm -hmm. And uh, this generic memo is up on my website. You can download it, put your boss's name in there. And it says, um, uh, I know you probably don't have this problem, but when I go to a cocktail party and I'm talking with a beautiful lady, she sometimes asks me, what do I do? And I say, uh, I'm a product manager. 
And then she might say, what's that? And I say, well, I put together the value proposition. I try to understand what my customer does. It's all part of the product market strategy, which consists, consists of things like uh, positioning and market research and market segmentation, blah, blah, blah. And by that point in time, she usually turns and walks away. So I say, uh, couldn't we change the name of my title to product success manager? And you could be the chief success, product success officer just like the chief financial officer, just like the chief marketing officer. Everyone else has a chief in their name. Um, and I said, you know exactly what they're doing if they say I'm in finance, I'm the chief financial officer. And then the rest of the memo goes on that says that do, if I do marry or uh, get, find someone, get married, uh, I'll invite you to the wedding. So if you successfully get your title changed, let me know. I'll, I'll put it on my uh, <laughs> wall of honor on my website. Uh, some guys in India started a product management uh, magazine, and I talked them into converting, uh, calling it product success. And then don't forget about my book, Wiley Books. And I offer a series of courses. These are available in person, and I do primarily pro uh, private training like at Cisco and other companies around the world. Uh, they're all also available as um, online courses on Udemy. Uh, they'll teach you what to do and how to do it, they come with a workbook, which is a Google Doc, which you get a copy of. And if, for example, if you take the product market strategy course for your product, when you're done with the course, you'll have a product market strategy or plan ready to go to work on. And the Jira plugin I mentioned earlier. And lastly, uh, I have an internship program. So if you want to gain some experience as a product manager, uh, send me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn and ask about it. And uh, you'll get free access to all those courses, which are worth several thousand dollars. Uh, and, um, and then you'll have a proof that you know how to do the job in the workbooks and the plans. And you'll have a letter of recommendation from me. And then coming along is the stuff I mentioned earlier, which is competency testing um, and recruiting. Any questions? Are these slides available? Uh, send me a note. I'll be happy to send you the slides. Thank you. Connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, say, please give me the slides. They're all in the book also. How would you describe Cisco's product management capability? You, you went into pretty good detail on Apple and HP. Would you regard Cisco as up there with those two? It's getting there because I've trained them. I've trained about 500 Cisco product managers. Um, and. Um, as more and more of them get trained and they go back. And product management, by the way, at Cisco is in engineering. So they have an engineering department, they have a marketing department, and a sales department. It's not a separate entity. In uh, Cisco services, they have, um, they're called project managers, but really they're product managers. So I have a question. What is the difference between project manager versus product manager? Say again. What I understand is project manager will be just responsible for yeah a project manager is responsible for identifying all the tasks that need to be done identifying all the people responsible and putting together a schedule and then hold everybody's feet to the fire and has no content it's all moving parts <laughs> go ahead <laughs> which, first. which uh uh, do you find that, that product management is handled differently in different companies? It seems like you've done a bit of training uh, across different companies. It sounds like in Cisco, product management is handling handled out of the engineering department. I've, I thought it was more handled out of the marketing department. What do you find? Is there any consistency or is it no. so, yeah? No. Uh, Google wants you to be a, 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 a solution architect. Um, Facebook is close to that. There's a good book out, I forget the guy's name, I think his last name is Lynn, on the product management interview. And he describes, he's been a recruiter for a lot of those companies. So he describes exactly what the idiosyncrasies are of each of those companies. Louis Lem, I think. Pardon? Louis Lem. Louis Lem? Is that his name? Yeah, what was his name? I think his last name is Lim, L I M. It's, uh, the book's on Amazon called The Product Management, management Interview. If you can't find it, uh, email me or uh, uh, send me a message on LinkedIn, I'll find it for you. So no, it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. And I advocate like that uh, 
quartered and uh, dragged and pulled with horses from the product manager. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was probably the first product manager. He was able to do all those things. Most of us are not Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so uh, with the introduction of agile methodologies around, uh, how in a broad sense have you seen that influencing product management and with the introduction of product owner titles and people trying to fit those roles vis-a-vis, -vis, just your feelings about all that. Yeah, that's caused more convolution. Uh, <laughs> product manager is separate and distinct from the product owner. The product owner's got to run the scrums, uh, may even be writing the stories. The product manager should be putting together the strategy. But we also have found that when I invented this concept of do, what do you do, how do you do it, where do you do it, and I have a template in that course on uh, how to write a do statement, you can easily translate that into a value proposition and easily translate it, that into a story. Yeah. And because writing stories are very, very difficult. It takes an expert to do that. Um, and combining those two as the same job, the product owner is tactical, the product manager needs to be strategic. Yeah. When I worked in Bell Labs, with the developers, there were always system engineers that were doing the details of the specs. So they were tight with the customer. They were creating the stories. Yes. yes. In this case, the system engineer was the product manager. Mm -hmm. Other questions? When I was at the Washington Post, we had a position called an ombudsman, which might be referred to as a reader advocate or a public editor. And basically, their job was to have empathy for the customer the reader, but they were very independent and they have the ability to go around and talk to anyone and then write freely and communicate those any concerns that came up. It sounds like you're saying that a product manager should be similar to that, should have yes. independence like that. Yep, absolutely. Okay. The Washington Post is great. I subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> we would be in a whole lot of doo-doo if we didn't have the Washington Post and the New York Times right? and BuzzFeed and Politico and uh, a few others. The Atlantic, the New Yorker magazine. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, one question I have is in most companies I've worked at, uh, product marketing has been separate from product management. And quite frankly, I've been very disappointed in product marketing. Either they didn't, they didn't have enough time for the product or they just didn't get the product. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, because I thought in your slide you made product marketing part of uh, under the product management. Yeah, that was just in the pyramid. Pyramid, right. yeah. yeah. Um, it should be. Uh, you got to have the higher level stuff in the company. Then you got to have the product manager that puts together the strategy. That based upon that strategy, the product marketing manager puts together the marketing plan, um, along with it, not in detail, but at least in terms of objectives. What media, for example, does that target customer consume? You figure that out when you're doing your uh, uh, personas during the product planning, not when you go to market. Right, but in your experience, have you found that these two are separate organizations? Uh, Sometimes, yeah. And the important thing is that they, the PM and the PMM are teamed up for a specific product, and the PMM is teamed up early on because the product marketing manager <coughs> will have more sensitivities to differences in different markets based upon culture and geography. None of us can keep the differences of all those cultures straight in our head at one time but the marketing people can. Are there certain industries that do product management better than other industries? Yeah, I think the tech industry. Uh, the rest of them don't think they need to do it. But it's necessary for cement, for steel, uh, for all, all the other things, the tech industry across the board. And the explosion of interest in the competencies of product management. 10 years ago, there was almost no conferences I think this thing was started like eight or nine years ago. This is the first one. About five years ago, I looked, there were 60 of these around the world. Now there are product management festivals. London, Ireland, Finland, Switzerland. One's coming to Singapore now. I trained the Singapore government on product management about six years ago. And after that, they had no interest in it. Now, somehow, uh, these guys out of Switzerland think they could do a conference there. Uh, my textbooks, the foundation's book, is being evaluated by the Chinese government to make it required reading in all their, their universities. 
but you can't get find me on Facebook in China. <laughs> Go blue, by the way, so your Michigan background. Um, just to follow up on this question about the product marketing, so I'm somebody who's uh, been doing product management for a number of years, tried to flirt with the idea of product marketing in a number of organizations, and, not real, and then I've become very, uh, uh, I've fallen out of love with the profession just because it's a very unknown field which tends to, 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 to exactly what his described, like the field is too unfined and then the CEO thinks he does his job, the product thinks it does his job, the marketer thinks his job. And so I almost feel I'm coming to terms with the fact that like, maybe the PMM is not, maybe it should be defined as a content deliverer that knows the market and can create the messaging very specific in region, but is not really uh, a GTM developer. I think maybe the product manager should be the GTM developer. And so I'm just, I just wonder if you had any thoughts, if you're seeing an ebb and flow in the PMM. Well, the field. things that the product manager does, the product success manager does, is lay out the strategy, the positioning. Someone then has to take the positioning, and that person I would call the product success marketing manager, mm -hmm. uh, and convert that positioning into messaging, mm -hmm. and help pick the media and the mix, and put together the budget for the marketing campaign, mm -hmm. uh, put together the demos, put together the training. Now, they may not do all that themselves, but they'll be driving the different departments to do those things in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. I think if you take some of these slides, they're all on my website, and show it to management, show it to HR, uh, you might be able to get some kind of agreement in order to reorganize to, to be most effective. Well, so as you go from a startup into larger organizations, a lot of what's PM and PMM almost don't exist when you're very small. Yeah, it does. It, it exists in the founders. In the heads. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But then they're going to get drawn off on some of all those other executive functions and they have no longer have time to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether they're smart enough to hire a good director of PM early or after they're at fire drill mode. Yeah. Uh, typically, when you get to about 30 employees, then you need to have dedicated PMs yeah. and you know, product success officers and product success uh, marketing managers. The, um, uh, what's his name, at, uh, Elon Musk at Tesla has the title Chief Product Officer. Mm -hmm. So he's focused mostly on product Obviously not in operations. <laughs> and Jobs is pretty much the chief product officer. Other questions? With that sort of crossover between a company being small that doesn't currently have a PM role, um, you know, I'm currently in a company that is not in that place, and I actually want to move to a company that, that already has an existing PM or an assistant PM to get into this. Uh, but in the interim, it'd be curious for me to see how could you implement a PM role in a company that doesn't have one that's dancing around with all these concepts and different people, executives' heads. It's a 200-person it's a 200, 200 company, size company, uh, a little over 30 million in revenue. So I think there's enough, you know, there, there could be that role there. What position are you in there? <laughs> Sales before I was a market analyst. I work day to day in our operations uh, and with our VP and CEO. It's, it's a small enough company. Do you have um, a rapport with your head of HR? Uh, she's new, Ross, but yeah. Okay. Um, theoretically, she may play a role in organizational structure, organizational development. So grab from my website the job descriptions mm. for product manager, product marketing manager and uh, put together a couple slides ahead of that, go in and sit down with her and say, look, this role here, we need all these things to be successful. Mm -hmm. This role here is done by this person. Yeah. This thing here is done by this person. This thing here is not done at all. And you just came from this product camp because you're interested in it. And you learn that these, th these things are done well by different people and these aren't done at all. And uh, ask for her help in convincing your executive committee to formalize the role and use my job descriptions, and then go out and hire for those job descriptions. Well, I'd rather be that than hire for it, <laughs> or else maybe <laughs> do it. Do the initiative. Don't yeah. ask for the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like it. And then once they set it up, you say. <laughs> <laughs> and then if they, I'll bet you during the process, one of them will say to you, um, "Where will we find somebody like this?" Yeah. Unfortunately, right. I, I want to sell a different product. So. <laughs> but, but yeah. Huh. And, and download the quit uh, 
quit whining, ask for your authority. Yeah. There'll be a few slides in there that you could use as part of that presentation. Other questions? I'll stay as long as you want to. How long were you at HP for? Two years. Oh, okay. Until when? Uh, 82. Oh, huh. um, I was hired in a corporate PR department to help them site new facilities. I used to be an environmental mediator. Mm -hmm. And what I learned in terms of being a professional mediator was very applicable to mediating disputes over products as a product manager. Huh. And then uh, and I handled Dave Packard's personal PR for a little bit. Huh. And then, uh, uh, then I was able to transition into office systems uh, and did uh, word processing, spreadsheets, database, report writers, that kind of stuff. And then it was from there that Apple recruited me because I was a trained HP product manager. Mm -hmm. Apple recognized the value of that. Thank you. Thank you.